Well, good morning, everybody. We're still letting people in here. And so please feel free to uh, get comfy here, fill out our poll questions, and we'll get started here in just a minute or two. All right, I'll give you a few moments here if you want to fill out that poll if you haven't already and I'll stop that poll here in about 30 seconds. All right, I'm going to stop the poll, share the results with you here. All right, so we'll go through these questions here real quick before we get started. So in 2019, how many acres of pumpkins were harvested in Illinois? The correct answer was C, uh, 10,900 acres were harvested. Uh, number two, what percentage of pumpkin-related sales occur in September, October, and November? Uh, if the correct answer is 70%, so I kind of tricked you on that one a little bit. Uh, number three, about how many seeds does the average pumpkin contain? It's actually about one cup of seeds. And the largest pumpkin pie ever baked, how much did it weigh? Uh, lucky one person here got it. It was the, the highest number, 3,699 pounds was the biggest pumpkin pie ever baked. All right, very good. Well, thank you so much for coming here on this Saturday morning. I'm really excited to be here with you to talk about pumpkins. So today we're gonna to do a variety of things. I'm gonna give you some background information about uh, pumpkins and specifically pumpkins in Illinois. Uh, we're gonna talk about some lessons and activities that we're gonna be releasing over the course of October and tell you how you can get those lessons as we release those. Uh, I'm gonna share a couple short videos with you to give you some more information. And then also gonna give you some other resources, some, um, some fiction text and some nonfiction text recommendations to uh, better incorporate pumpkins into your classroom. Uh, a lot of focus will be on elementary. I do have some things for middle school and high school a little bit, but most of our stuff will be um, focused more towards those lower grades. Um, I'll also say if you uh, attended my pumpkin session this summer, there will be some repeats from that, but I also have some brand new stuff here today as well. All right, with that, I'm gonna go ahead and get started. All right, so uh, some Illinois pumpkin facts for you. So I think a lot of people, when they think of Illinois agriculture, we, we think corn and soybeans, and that's, that's true. Those are major, major commodities grown in Illinois. But Illinois is also the number one pumpkin producing state in the nation by a long shot. I think we produce over twice as much as the next state in line, the number two state. So we actually grow 90 to 95% of the pumpkins used for processing, and over 85% of the world's pumpkins are processed uh, in Morton, Illinois. So Morton's called the, the pumpkin capital of the world for that reason. So this graphic here is um, from our brand new pumpkin ag mag, which I'm going to talk more about here soon, and gives you an idea of not only how much we harvest, but also the value of those pumpkins. So you can see in 2019, uh, almost $18 million worth of pumpkins were harvested here in Illinois. 
And so just to give you an idea of where this is happening, so you can see this cluster of four counties here uh, in, in uh, north, central, western Illinois here. Uh, so it's an interesting connection here of you know, why we grow, what we grow, and where we grow it. So not only does this part of the state have really good soil conditions and climate conditions to grow pumpkins, but also they have the Libby's plant there. And so it's kind of this interesting combination of it's, it's a good place to grow pumpkins, but it also needs that processing part of it to provide a market for those pumpkins. And I think that's, that's something that, that we don't always think about with farmers that, you know, not only do they need to be good at growing those things, but they also have to have a market because no matter how good they are at growing them, if they don't have a market, it doesn't, doesn't really make a difference. So again, most of those pumpkins process right there in Morton, Illinois. Another thing I wanted to point out was this idea of uh, pollination in pumpkins, because I think a lot of times, I'm sure a lot of you uh, teach some pollination units, but I think oftentimes pumpkins aren't, we don't think of them as a natural fit to talk about pollination, when actually they're a, a really good way to talk about that. One, the blossoms on, on pumpkin plants and squash plants are, look very similar, but they're, they're very large blossoms. So visually, it's a really easy way to show students how pollination works. And especially if you can get your hands on some of these blossoms, it's a, it's a really cool way to, to show uh, in, in big ways because these blossoms are so big. Uh, I was a, a beekeeper for years, and so I'm, I'm pretty familiar with, with honeybees. And I think a lot of the attention um, that pollinators get is focused on, on honeybees, as it should be. They're, they're very, very important pollinators, and um, I think they're just absolutely fascinating creatures as well. But the reality is uh, honeybees are actually not native to, uh, to the U.S. They were actually imported and brought in to pollinate. Um, specifically, um, apple trees was one of the early things that they brought honeybees in to, uh, to be able to pollinate. Um, but for pumpkins, honeybees are considered a pollinator for pumpkins, but the most important pollinator for pumpkins is what's called a squash bee, which is this bee right here in this picture uh, in the upper left corner. So you can see squash bees are a little bit bigger than honeybees. They're, they're also hairier, their legs especially here. So honeybees have pollen sacs where they'll they push pollen down into these sacs to haul it back to their hive. Squash bees uh, have these, these hairy legs that the pollen attaches to. And so you can imagine when they go from flower to flower, that pollen spreads a lot more easily. Squash bees are also different. Honeybees live in these you know, big hives. So uh, middle of the summer, a, a honeybee hive might have 70 to 80,000 bees in one hive. Squash bees live more solitary lives and they, they dig these little burrows underground and, uh, and, and don't live in these massive hives like honeybees do. So a very different type of pollinator, but doing something very similar. So I point that out because I think it's an interesting uh, way to look at um, pollination with pumpkins, but also to learn about a pollinator that many people don't really know a whole heck of a lot about as well. So that's pollination and, uh, and squash bees. All right, I also wanted to show you um, a little video of, because I think we don't often think about, we, we think about a pumpkin patch, we think about growing pumpkins, but we don't often think about processing pumpkins. And so this is a really short video that Libby's produced that just shows their process and how they contract with farmers to grow pumpkins for them. And I think you'll see the pumpkins grown for processing don't even look like the pumpkins that we would go and pick at the pumpkin patch. They're, patch, they're very, very different um, pumpkins. And so I'm gonna show you this, this short video. It's just like a minute and a half long, give you a better idea of, uh, of commercial processing pumpkin production here in Illinois. Everybody knows this is the pumpkin capital of the world. It's a combination of, of the actual contents of the soil plus uh, the temperatures is what really makes it great. And that sets the sugars inside the, the fruit itself. There's the finished product, beautiful, beautiful looking color. That'll be a perfect can of pumpkin. We have a prioritized seed that the other canning company does not have. We take it to the farmers in about March or April. It is just pumpkin seeds in white bags, and uh, it'll go in the end of April, 1st of May. We'll usually look probably to be cultivating them within five, six weeks. 120 days from the time it's planted to the time we harvest. Once the pumpkin leaves the field, it is brought to the uh, facility here. It gets sliced, washed, and de-seeded. It takes about two hours from the field into the can as a finished product. And then we move it to the customer as soon as possible. It, it is pretty quick. A can of Libby's pumpkin has one ingredient, 100% pure pumpkin. 
only pumpkin, 100% natural. Nothing else added, nothing else taken away from it. Pumpkin is definitely in the culture of Morton, Illinois. Pumpkin capital of the world. So cool video to, uh, to possibly show your students, but also just to get a little background information to see uh, that process. So I can tell you, I grow some pie pumpkins myself that I, I like to make homemade pumpkin pie in the fall. And uh, it takes me a heck of a lot longer than two hours to go from, from field to can. So, uh, so that's a pretty amazing process that they've got there. All right, I'm gonna transition here to talking a little bit about some of the things that uh, Illinois Ag in the Classroom is gonna be offering uh, over uh, the course of October for uh, your students not only to do at school, but also some challenges that we're gonna invite them to do at home as well. So things that you can send home with them to encourage them to do with their families. And so all of our, our lessons and our challenges we're releasing on Facebook and Instagram. And so the idea is that um, uh, with our challenges, we have, we have the release dates that you have listed here with our lesson plans, we're gonna release those the week before. So our thought is that we'll give teachers time to gather whatever materials they need and you've got some lead time. If you wanna incorporate that lesson into your curriculum, you've got some time to still do that in the month of October. So here coming up next week, we're gonna start our October classroom challenge. So we're trying to do kind of a STEM related challenge for your classroom. And so we're challenging students to try to design some kind of farm machine to get uh, pumpkins from the field to the processing plant. Uh, for our family engagement challenge, we're challenging families to make a pumpkin scale. So this would be using uh, hanging a coat hanger on a, on a doorknob and then finding out how to uh, make a contraption where you can put a small pumpkin on one side and then balance it with something else to try to figure out how much does this pumpkin weigh based on how even the scale is. And then our final challenge is coming out on October 13th. Uh, our family cooking challenge is making pumpkin bread, which is a cool activity in Illinois because odds are, as we've talked about, if you're buying canned pumpkin in the store, it was most likely grown right here in Illinois. So a cool way to get students to, uh, to think about the stuff that's actually grown uh, in their state. So again, all those will be released. We're encouraging people to, uh, to tag us, to, to add pictures on our social media, and we'll share those things that students are doing uh, with those challenges. In addition to challenges, I know many of you have attended our, our author, our first author interview and also some of our field trips so far. And so um, we're continuing to do those throughout the rest of the fall. On October 1st, we're going to Heap's Giant Pumpkin Farm. This is a really cool farm and they, they do specialize. They grow some giant pumpkins like this one pictured in here. So we're really excited to go there on October 1st. We're also meeting with uh, Patricia uh, Tote, who's the author of Pick a Pumpkin, which is one of the Illinois Reads uh, book selections here this year. Um, and so we're really excited to talk to her also. Uh, if you haven't yet signed up for those, um, I'm gonna provide links for that here at the end of the presentation to get signed up for that. And then it will be just like this format. It'll be a webinar format. We'll send you the link a couple days in advance. And each of those is about a 30 minute uh, field trip. And so you and your students can Join us for that live, or we'll also uh, record it and give you access to the recorded version to watch with them later on. So, so we're really excited about those. And again, um, those are the two we're offering in October, and then we're gonna continue to do that uh, in the months of November and December uh, uh, as well. All right, so I'm gonna transition to talking about some of our lessons. So we have this schedule, and I'll, I'll give you access to this as well to keep everything straight. And so this kind of shows all of our pumpkin-related lessons that we're gonna be releasing throughout the course of October. So I'll go through and kind of give you a little preview of each one and kind of show you what they're about so you can get an idea if it's something that you'd like to do in your classroom. So this is my, uh, my work from home partner here. This is my son, Lincoln. He's gonna turn seven next week. So you'll see him in some pictures here and then he also helped me with a, a new video I did this week also. So our first lesson here is called What's in My Pumpkin? So this is a really cool way to, uh, to get students to think about the different parts of a pumpkin, but also thinking a little bit about sequencing and a little bit of storytelling here. So essentially uh, what you need is some yarn and uh, some paper plates. And so the idea here is they're gonna make a little book, right? To show what's inside their pumpkin. So you take a orange paper plate, cut the inside of it out, uh, staple or glue that or tape that to a white paper plate to show that it's the shell. You're gonna glue on some uh, yellow and orange yarn to be the pulp. You can glue on some pumpkin seeds to be the seeds. And then the final page uh, is, is kind of summing up all the different parts of the pumpkin there. And then the lesson will provide uh, there, we have longer sentences that you can write out here to get kids thinking about that and do some writing on there as well. So that's what's inside my pumpkin. 
Uh, and again, this is a cool way to, to get kids also not only to understand it for themselves, but to take it home and talk to their parents about it and kind of repeat that knowledge as a way to, to better learn that information too. Our next lesson here is pumpkin chain. Uh, again, using these, these uh, awesome orange paper plates. This is a really cool way to talk about the life cycle of a pumpkin. And so we have, we'll, we'll give you all of these different uh, templates here to cut out. So we've got the seed, and then that goes to the leaf, and then the blossoms come, and then uh, the green pumpkin turns into an orange pumpkin, and then we can carve that into a jack-o'-lantern. So you can do it a couple different ways depending on the skill set of your students. I use just one big piece of yarn and just kind of strung it through the entire thing. You can also use shorter pieces and have them individually tie each one on there. Um, and then the idea is that you can't quite tell in the picture, but uh, we have two orange uh, paper plates stapled together and then we've left a gap here and so that the entire chain will fit inside of there and then they can pull that chain out of the jack-o'-lantern to demonstrate that life cycle of the pumpkin. Again, this is a good way to incorporate uh, talking about pollination, um, talking about these blossoms here, and you can bring in the squash bees and talk about that with this here as well. So we really like that make and take. It's a good way to talk about life cycle of a plant, uh, specifically pumpkins in this case. Our next one here is 3D pumpkins. And so there's a couple different ways that you could do this. And the lesson plan that we'll release uh, in a couple weeks, we have these strips that already, already have these pumpkin facts written out on them. And so depending again on the level of your students, you could just give them the facts. If you had a, a little bit older students who you wanted to do some kind of mini research project, it might be something you can incorporate with our uh, pumpkin ag mag, which I'll talk more about here soon. Um, you could just cut out strips of orange paper and have them do some research to learn some facts about pumpkins. And then you just need a couple of these little brads, a little uh, green piece of construction paper for the leaf. And essentially you uh, put the strips together, you poke a hole here, put a brad in the middle, uh, wrap them up to the top uh, and then poke a hole again and connect the whole thing together. And then when you just pull the pieces of paper apart, uh, you create this little 3D pumpkin. Lots of other uh, fruits and vegetables you could do this with, with different colored construction paper. So this is definitely something you could adapt for other things. And again, something you could do for younger students, but also you can make it more challenging adding in that research component with, uh, with older students as well. So that's 3D pumpkin. And then uh, again, I mentioned that, that new pumpkin ag mag. And so this is a couple pages out of our brand new ag mag. You can see a couple of these graphics are ones that um, I've already shown you in this presentation. So we're really pleased with our new pumpkin ag mag. There's lots of great stuff in there. And those are available right now. You can get free classroom sets of those. So all you need to do is contact your county ag literacy coordinator. So if you go to aginetheclassroom.org, uh, on the left-hand side, there's a link that says contact your county ag literacy coordinator. And you can find your county, find out who that person is if you haven't already connected with them in the past. And um, they can get you free classroom sets of our ag mags and so they're hot off the press they're ready to go and so uh, please take advantage of that and uh, we, we really want those to get in the hands of students here this fall and uh, so yeah take advantage of that all the poll questions that i did all that information came from uh, this ag mag and then a lot of the other content that we've talked about here regarding pumpkins is all in the ag mag plus a whole lot more there's some uh, uh, social studies history type connections in there and a number of other things as well that you can use we also have these career profiles. And so we try to contact people who are in different ag related careers um, and they do profiles as well. So we have a farmer who grows processing pumpkins. We have a researcher at the U of I who studies plant diseases. And then we have Kaylee Heap, who is uh, one of the farmers at Heap's Giant Pumpkin Farm that we're going to take our field trip to here uh, in a couple weeks. So that's our pumpkin ag mag. Lots of ways you can incorporate that in. Um, those are written at about uh, a third or fourth grade reading level. But again, um, there's lots of stuff that can be used for younger or older kids in all those ag mags. And we have those for a number of different topics. Um, we also have a brand new Apple ag mag out this fall. And so um, check that out on our website. There's, there's lots and lots of different ag mags that you can get copies of for your students. All right, the last lesson that we're going to release uh, here this fall is uh, pumpkin pie in a bag, which you may have seen before. I'm gonna stop my share for a second. Looks like my video kind of gunked up there. So let me see if I can share that again. Just give me one second here. All right. Try that again. 
All right. All right, so this is a video that our summer intern made this, this past summer to show you how to make pumpkin pie in a bag. And uh, yeah, I, I said before, I, I like to make my homemade pumpkin pie, but, uh, but man, there's not, nothing wrong with this uh, pumpkin pie in a bag. It's, it's pretty great. So we'll take a few minutes here and watch this uh, pumpkin pie in a bag video. crust. And so for our crust, I put a sheet of graham cracker, 
And all I have to do is crush it up in this bag. And you can take like a rolling pin or get a little kid to pound it with their fist if you want it to be more crumbly, but really, this is enough for me. So next, I'm gonna take my little Dixie cup. This is a three ounce Dixie cup. And I'm gonna dump some graham cracker crumbs in the bottom. And I'm gonna make two, one for me and one for my assistant. You can go ahead and take your pumpkin pie and cut a nice hole in the corner. I have some pretty hefty dirty kitchen scissors here, but you can just use paper scissors as well. And then you're just going to squeeze just like that. And then the best part. In this case, ready with. Nice and on the top. And then, because I'm feeling fancy today, I'm gonna put just a little, oops, a little dash of cinnamon on top. <laughs> that one looks a little better. <laughs> and then, all we need is a friend or an assistant to help me enjoy it. <laughs> and there you had it. You've made pumpkin pie in a bag. All right, so uh, thanks to Hannah for that. Uh, she mentioned the, uh, the Ziplocs, uh, making sure you have good Ziplocs. I think this is also why they invented duct tape. So if you want more of an insurance policy to make sure that uh, you don't have pumpkin pie filling all over your classroom, uh, duct taping that seam at the top is not a terrible idea. Uh, you can also buy graham cracker crumbs that are already crumbled up. If you want one less thing to have be a mess, um, you can buy those crumbs uh, ahead of time and not have to, uh, to worry about that. All right. That is pumpkin pie in a bag. All right. So uh, the last lesson idea I want to show you here is not one that we're releasing as a lesson, but uh, I think it's a pretty cool experiment and something that I wanted to share. And so uh, I'm a former high school English teacher. And so I dusted off my, my science skills here and did this pumpkin experiment with my son. And uh, I think it's pretty cool. Um, I'll also say if I haven't said already, if you have questions as we go, um, please use that, that Q&A feature on here. And we've got people besides me on the call who can answer questions. And then um, at the end, I'll also be available to answer questions. So anything I talk about, you have a question about, please make sure to, uh, to use that Q&A feature there. All right, so uh, this is my exploding pumpkin experiment, which I hope you think is as cool as I do. Hi, I'm Chris with Illinois Agriculture in the Classroom. And I'm Lincoln. And today we're going to do a really cool science experiment using a pumpkin that Lincoln grew all by himself. Yep. Lincoln, did you know that Illinois grows more pumpkins than any other state in the whole country? Yeah, you say that all the time. Oh, I do? Okay. Well, um, tell you what, here's one you maybe don't know. Did you know that we got the tradition of carving pumpkins into jack-o'-lanterns from Irish immigrants? I did not know that. Yeah, when they first came to our country, they had a tradition of carving faces into turnips. When they got to America, they found pumpkins and realized they were much easier to carve. And so we now have a tradition of making jack-o'-lanterns. So the first step that we're gonna do with our experiment today is we're gonna carve this pumpkin into a jack-o'-lantern. All right, now we are ready for the science part of this experiment. We have our jack-o'-lantern made. We have a, a small cup inside the jack-o'-lantern, and into that cup, I put one cup of hydrogen peroxide. This is 12% hydrogen peroxide. This is much, much stronger than the stuff you'll find in your medicine cabinet. Uh, you can buy it at beauty supply stores. We got ours online. So we have one cup of hydrogen peroxide. Into that, Lincoln is gonna pour two tablespoons of dish soap. 
While he's doing that, I have two packets of regular active dry yeast. I'm gonna pour those two packets into six tablespoons of warm water. I'm gonna stir this, and then Lincoln is gonna take some green food coloring. And put it in there. And then you're gonna drop a few drops of that green food coloring into there. Now, is it time? We're almost there. So, or we could just pour that and then, then it will start? It should, yeah. Okay. So now, I gotta get this yeast all stirred up here. And this is the part where it'll look like foamy green slime. Yeah. Well, it will be green. Okay. Okay. You want me to pour it in? Yes. Okay. So we did it right. We should see a vomiting pumpkin here. Okay. Give me a countdown here. One, two, three. <laughs> Look at that! It's not really green. It's not green, yeah, the food coloring didn't mix in, did it? No. Wow! Pretty cool. That's not what I thought it would be. Like. Yeah? Alright, let's talk a little bit about the science part of this. Hydrogen peroxide is made up of hydrogen and oxygen. It naturally degrades, that's why you always see hydrogen peroxide sold in, in bottles that are not clear. So, the yeast is functioning as a catalyst to force the oxygen out of that solution. And so, by adding the dish soap, the dish soap captures that oxygen and that's what creates this foam. This is also an uh, exothermic chemical reaction. So this, if we touch this, it would be a warm to the touch. It creates heat when it causes this reaction. So, in addition to being really cool to see a pumpkin vomit, it's also a really cool way to talk about a number of different science concepts and also tie in a little bit of agriculture here with our pumpkin. All right, well, we're pretty pleased with that for our first attempt at the vomiting pumpkin experiment. And thanks for watching. Still trying to make this stuff green. Maybe what would have been really cool is if we pour it in and we quickly put the lid on. Oh, and force all of it to come out the front? Yeah. That's a cool idea, yeah. Maybe yeah. the next time we'll try that. All right. Uh, so, oops. Uh, I will tell you, too, uh, it was hard to tell in the video, but that produced, there was a lot of foam that came out the back of the pumpkin and went on the ground. So it produced probably three or four times more than what you actually could see on that view of it. So uh, it, it's pretty cool. I think, I think Lincoln's idea of, of capping the top off is probably a good one because it would really make a lot more come out the front of it. So, um, so yeah, I think that's pretty cool. Pretty cool little experiment. It doesn't take very long and it's really, it's really easy to get that, uh, that hydrogen peroxide to, uh, to be able to do that. So, so that's our exploding or our, our vomiting pumpkin experiment there. All right, I'm gonna switch gears here a little bit. Uh, for each month, we have a theme, which we've talked about pumpkins as our theme for October. And we've also had a, a sub theme that we're trying to promote as well. And so for October, we're trying to do a little bit with farm machinery as well. So I wanted to talk to you about a couple things related to farm machinery, because there's lots of cool connections that we can, we can make with our students with that as well. So this is a graphic that I'm gonna put up on our blog site when I, when I post uh, the, the recorded webinar and everything else, I'll have this available to you. So this is something that uh, we worked on this summer with the consumer engagement part of our office. And it's just a graphic to show all the different types of a combine, which I think a lot of people don't necessarily think about all the different things, all the different uh, steps that the combine combines together uh, to, to harvest grain. Uh, in addition to this graphic, we've got this video, and I'm not going to show you the whole video, but I just want to show you just a, a tiny bit of it to show you how the video kind of corresponds uh, with this graphic. So I'm just going to play this just for a, a few seconds here. Hi, I'm Jack McCormick, a farmer from Randolph County, Illinois. And I'd like to tell you how a combine works. You see these great big things in the fields and on the roads, and I'll kind of tell you how, how they work. First up front, this is the combine header. And all this does is cut and gather the crop. It doesn't do any separating of any kind. Uh, these so you can kind of see as you go through the video, it's color coded with that ties in with this graphic and kind of shows that different process as you go through. So a really cool way to combine 
um, two kind of alternative te alternative texts, right? We have this infographic here as well as a video that goes with it. So uh, a, a neat way to talk about this machinery. Again, I'll have both these posted on uh, the blog site uh, for uh, this session, which I'll show you how to get to that here uh, when we're closer to being done. So, uh, so take advantage of that. Some good ways to talk about combines. I also wanted to talk a little bit about tractors. And so um, for those of you who haven't um, seen me pre present before, I, I have a small specialty crop farm with my wife. And so we're a very, very small farm, half an acre. So really, really different than uh, a lot of what you think about as agriculture in Illinois. So we have a tractor that, that's technically a tractor, but it's very different than like say the John Deere international tractors that we're used to seeing. So I'm going to talk a little bit about our farm's tractor as well as uh, something called a PTO. And I'm going to uh, close out of this real quick and see if that fixes that. There we go. All right. All right. So uh, we'll watch this short video uh, about my farm's uh, kind of uh, odd little tractor. Hey everybody, I'm Chris with Illinois Agriculture in the Classroom, and today I'm here to talk to you about farm machinery. Specifically, I wanna to talk to you about tractors. Now, I'm gonna assume that most of us know what a tractor looks like. We've probably seen them parked in a field, going down the road, doing some kind of field work. They look something like this, except bigger, and a lot of them have cabs on them nowadays. Uh, they're not made of plastic, and uh, real tractors aren't powered by overpriced batteries that need to be charged every single day of your life. But other than all those things, it looks pretty much like this. The average size farm in Illinois is about 375 acres. So it makes sense if you're trying to farm that much land, you need a big tractor with lots of power in order to work that quantity of land. On my own specialty crop farm, we're much, much smaller. We're only a half an acre, which is about the size of half a football field. To have a big tractor like you would normally see out in the field doesn't make any sense at all for our farm. And so we have what's called a two-wheel tractor. There's a lot of differences with our little tractor than what you'd normally see out in like a corn or a soybean field, but there's actually a lot of similarities as well. Basically, tractors need to do a couple different things for farmers. One important thing that tractors do is they pull things, right? We've, all, we've probably all seen tractors pulling large implements behind them. So they need to pull things, but also they need to, in some cases, power those things. And the way that they do that is through what's called a PTO, or a power takeoff. And what happens is the tractor transfers power from its engine into whatever thing that it's pulling. So in this case, I have my little 13 horsepower engine, and through a series of gears, it transfers power to whatever I have hooked up behind my two-wheel tractor. Same exact concept as what happens in a big full-size tractor. This is just for a much smaller scale. This is the tiller that we use on our farm. This is called a harrow plow. It's different from a rototiller that you'd normally use in a garden that actually inverts the soil, flips it like this way. A harrow plow stirs the soil this way. So there's a series of blades coming down in different shafts here that go like this through the soil. And the way that this is powered is through the PTO. And so you can see this hooks up into the PTO shaft on my two-wheel tractor. There's a pin that goes down in here to hold it in place. And then when I, uh, when I push the PTO lever to power this implement, when I go, it starts moving this tiller through the soil, pushes my two-wheel tractor forward, and also powers this plow behind it. We have a number of other things that go on this two-wheel tractor as well. So we have a bed shaper. We use raised beds on our farm. So this hills the earth uh, to make 30-inch wide raised beds. We also have a rotary plow. Uh, we use this to break in new ground. So if we're trying to convert part of our lawn into a new uh, garden space, we would use this. And then we also have a sickle bar mower that uh, you can see is really good for cutting really tall grasses or plants off right at their base. Uh, these two are powered also by our PTO. This one doesn't need to be powered. So all the tractor has to do with this one is to just pull it. So for my two-wheel tractor, in addition to uh, powering the wheels and powering an implement by pulling it, I sometimes need it to also push things. So this is my mower. This is called a flail mower. And this mower discharges everything that I mow up right back here. And so you can imagine, it's pretty dangerous for me to stand here and mow something down when everything is getting kicked back towards my feet. So this uh, tractor is versatile in that it allows me to push or pull things with the same unit. All I need to do 
is take off these handles here and I can spin my handlebars all the way around. And you can see now, once I get those levers attached again, I'm ready to mow and it, instead it's pushing everything the opposite direction. Now, the only thing that I need to change is, it's kind of unique to this machine, this is the front of my tractor. So if I start going forward, it's actually gonna go backwards. And so I need to change it to reverse. And now when I'm going in reverse, I'm actually going forward. So very different kind of tractor than what we're maybe used to seeing, but it works on the very similar uh, technology of using a PTO to power implements to do work on our farm. So different than what uh, traditional farmers might use in Illinois and around the country, but for a small scale farm like ours, this is all the tractor I need and is actually a better tool for what I need to do on my farm. So I hope you learned a little bit about farm machinery, specifically about tractors and PTOs. We'll see you next time. I'll, uh, I'll admit more than I maybe should, but I, uh, I, I can geek out about my two-wheel tractor for much, much longer than that. And so uh, I, I love that thing and I love looking up new implements I can buy for and all sorts of stuff. So uh, that was actually the second version of that video. The first version I made and fully edited and showed it to my wife. And it was about two or three times longer than that. And she said, Chris, no one cares about that much about your two-wheel tractor. And so I had to go back and do it again because self-editing is, is very hard to do. So uh, hopefully that wasn't too long the second go round because I cut out a lot of stuff that I wanted to talk about, but uh, my wife assured me that you didn't need to know quite that much about my tractor. So, all right, so uh, that's my tractor. Hopefully you learned a little bit about that concept of a PTO. I think that's something we probably kind of know is out there, but maybe didn't fully understand how that works. And I think especially don't always know how it works on something besides the, the big tractors that you're, that you're maybe used to seeing. All right, as I kind of get towards the end here, I wanna give you some additional resources. Um, so I like to try to share an addition. I'm gonna give you some, some um, picture books and things, fiction books that um, were useful, but I wanted to give you some other alternate tech, alternative texts as well. And so I've got a couple nonfiction resources here. Um, any, if any of you uh, get the Illinois uh, Farm Bureau Partners Magazine, if you have country insurance, you probably get Partners Magazine. There was a great article a couple of years ago about uh, how Illinois is the great pumpkin state. Um, this is a very student friendly resource from U of I Extension that has a bunch of different pumpkin facts. That would actually be a really good resource to use with that 3D pumpkin activity. And then this uh, resource right here is a brand new article on allrecipes.com. And they actually interviewed some, um, some coworkers of ours about um, whether or not there's a pumpkin shortage this year. Uh, I'll, I'll spoil it, there's not. Uh, but things are a little bit different this year with getting pumpkin. And so, um, so that's a really cool resource too. And it's got some up-to-date information about pumpkin, uh, processing pumpkins right now this season. I've also got some other videos for you. Uh, and I'm not going to show these. I just want to kind of go through them real quick so you can go back and look at them later. Um, this is a, there's a giant pumpkin growing club in Illinois and they have contests every year and they come together and bring their giant pumpkins and weigh them. And then the winner wins like 500 bucks or something like that. I can't remember exactly what it is, but um, this is a video that they produced to show that process of this giant pumpkin uh, competition. Uh, there's also a drone video here of harvesting pumpkins here in central Illinois. And so you can show your students that process of what that looks like. Similar to some of the images that you saw in that Libby's video, but this is a little bit longer. Um, this one is, doesn't really have a whole lot of education value. It's just kind of cute. Uh, Brookfield Zoo uh, carved jack-o'-lanterns and gave them to a number of their animals. And you can just watch Brookfield Zoo animals eat jack-o'-lanterns. It's kind of cute. And then this video here is another one that I did. Uh, we had a pretty big pumpkin patch at our yard this year uh, in our garden. My son wanted to, to grow pumpkins uh, to sell them. And so we let that kind of be his pet project. And so I stopped by a processing pumpkin field and talk about that process and then also show you our little pumpkin patch and then what we're doing with that. I also talk a little bit about pumpkin pollination. So another good way to bring in that idea of pollination into your class as well. So again, I'll have links for all this stuff. Uh, on the blog site for you. And I'll also have this presentation on there that you can link from. All right, some books that uh, we recommend. These are all great texts to talk about pumpkins. This Pick a Pumpkin, again, this is the author, Patricia Todd. We're gonna interview her in a couple weeks here about her book, Pick a Pumpkin. Uh, I have a funny story about Pumpkin Jack. We've read that uh, twice at our house in the last week. My son really liked it. And uh, 
he grew all these pumpkins and we had one that we had up on our deck that was already kind of rotting it there was something wrong with it it didn't last and so we have our, our chicken coop is right behind our house so i took that pumpkin and threw it as high as i could in the air and so it just splattered everywhere in the chicken runs and then the chickens of course just went crazy for it i thought it was really cool and, and kind of oddly satisfying uh, my son decided that that pumpkin was really special to him and he didn't realize that that was going to happen to that pumpkin and was very upset with me. So because we had read Pumpkin Jack, which is about this process of a boy plants a pumpkin, makes it a jack-o'-lantern and then realizes he can't keep it forever. And then a new pumpkin, he puts the, the pumpkin out in the, out in the garden and the seeds are there and a new pumpkin grows the next year and he gets more and more and more pumpkins from Pumpkin Jack and then he gets a new Pumpkin Jack the next year. So we had talked a lot about that. And so I was able to kind of use Pumpkin Jack to, uh, to calm him down and help him realize, hey, we're, we're feeding our chickens and we're gonna, we can take the seeds and use them for something else to grow, to grow more pumpkins next year. So, so Pumpkin Jack's a really great book. Again, talk about that life cycle, talk about kind of that idea of, of decay and the seasons changing and those kind of things. It also has just really beautiful illustrations in it as well. Um, from seed to pumpkin is a really good one again to talk about that life cycle this would be a good one to use with the uh, the pumpkin chain as well as this life cycle of pumpkin is a good one also uh, and then how big could your pumpkin grow that would be good to tie in uh, even as we go visit the, the giant pumpkin farm here in a couple of weeks that would be a great one to tie in with that so those are all recommended elementary books there's a lot more really good pumpkin books out there but those are some of our favorites um, for middle and high school, I really like both of these books. I, I read these both this year. And so Pumpkin Heads is by Rainbow Rowell. She's a, a pretty well-known uh, young adult author. And so this is her first graphic novel. And it's about uh, a couple kids. They're getting ready. Uh, it's, the, it's the end of, I think they're getting ready to go off to, to college. They're working at a pumpkin farm, uh, like a pumpkin patch type farm. And they're, uh, they have all these challenges and kind of come together as friends. And it's, it's got a lot of great stuff in it. Um, and again, the illustrations are really cool in that too. Um, this Joan Bauer book, Squashed. This is a little bit older book. This is probably from like the, the mid to late 90s. It's, it's really good. It's, it's a high school girl who's struggling with the, all the awkwardness that comes with being in high school. And uh, on top of that, to make her even more awkward, she's really passionate about growing a giant pumpkin for the town's giant pumpkin festival every year. And so she's constantly doing all this stuff to grow the biggest pumpkin that she possibly can to win the contest. And so it's, it's told from her, her point of view um, and it's, it's really witty and funny and uh, it's, it's, a, it's a, a cute story. So I, I really recommend Squashed also. Um, if you wanna incorporate those with some other texts, I've got some poems here. These are all historical poems that deal with different uh, things regarding pumpkins and fall. And so these are all really good resources again to pull in some some kind of alternative text to go with some of these longer texts as well. All right, so that's the middle and high school recommendations. All right, I'm getting towards the end here. And so I'm gonna start checking out the Q&A to see if there's anything else I need to answer. What I do wanna say before I do that, a couple reminders for you guys. Uh, fill out your reflection if you'd like us to email you a certificate of completion so you can try to get PD credit for this. Uh, make sure to fill that out. We're going to give you about a week to fill that out. And so when we get done today, if you want to do it real quick, it'll just take you a, a couple minutes at the most. Um, get that sent in to us and then we will get that certificate mailed out to you. Um, there's a link to that in the email that I sent you uh, for the Zoom link today. If you also want to take this, this tiny URL here, you can type that directly in and get to it that way also. Um, today's session is sponsored by Illinois Farm Bureau and your county farm bureaus. And so as part of that, anyone who fills out the reflection, we're gonna also send you a special gift. And then for three randomly drawn people, you're gonna get the special gift. Uh, in addition to, you're gonna get a copy of uh, Pick a Pumpkin by Patricia Todd. And so, so fill that out, lots of good reasons to do that. Again, try to do that sooner than later before you forget to do that. Um, all of our October lessons and activities are being placed on our blog, which is beyondthebarndoor.wordpress.com. There is a link at the top that says uh, fall 2020 and then has um, links to each month. And so all that stuff will be posted there. And then we're also gonna be promoting it on Facebook and Instagram. So we'll have links each week. You can get the links for that. All those lessons are coming out Thursday mornings at 9 a.m. Uh, and you can link to the blog from our Facebook page also. Last thing I wanna remind you of, if you haven't already, if you've already signed up, you don't need to do it again. But if you haven't, if you're interested in getting Zoom webinar links for our field trips or our author visits, 
Those are right here. Again, you can get access to those um, if you go to beyondthebarndoor.wordpress.com on that homepage. There's links that take you to the forms to fill out and we will email you that uh, information as well. All right. I'm going to hey, look Chris, at this is, Chris, this is Kevin. Uh, can you kind of give the spoiler alert about why we can't find pumpkins in grocery stores right now? I know you yeah. provide link but uh i've had a couple people text me privately about that so okay them the answer yeah so um part of it is that we've seen some various uh examples of the supply chain disruption that's happened because of the pandemic and so part of it is related to that of just getting those pieces fit together a little differently this year the other part is uh pumpkins got planted a little bit later this year than normal and so we've got a good harvest of pumpkins coming in. They're just a little bit later. And so as you saw at that Living's video, once they get to the plant, they are ready to go literally within hours to be then shipped out, but they're just coming to stores a tiny bit later. The other thing that they're kind of uh, thinking is happening is because so many more people are at home, uh, they're thinking more about fall and about getting ready for some of these things. And so they're buying some things earlier than they normally would be when they are busier and have a lot more going on. And so it's caused a little bit of a shortage just because people are buying stuff earlier than they normally would be. So, um, so yeah, some things that you don't normally think about with agriculture, we take it for granted when we can just go to the store and always get whatever we want, but there's uh, a lot of moving pieces that go with that. So, um, and just to Chris, remind, yeah. We have to take the blame for that. It's only September 19th. You should still be talking about apples. And here we yeah. are talking about pumpkins. So exactly, yeah. Hold tight, folks. Give them just a little bit of time. Pumpkins, 120 days, and they planted them light. So. And I mean, it was got down to like 38 or 39 degrees at my house last night. And so it feels like it should be pumpkin weather, but uh, we're, we're not quite there yet. Yeah. So just to remind you, if I go, I'll go back here. Um, if you want that, that article is right here, this allrecipes.com article, is there a pumpkin shortage this year? All right. Well, I'm not seeing any other questions here. Uh, looks like Kevin's answered uh, all the ones that were there. So I'll give you a minute here. If anybody has any additional questions, I'll, I'll stick around for a minute to answer them. Uh, thank you so much for joining us on a Saturday morning. I think it's great. We had so many people on here um, taking time out of their weekend to learn more about pumpkins and Illinois agriculture and trying to incorporate that into their classrooms. Um, again, check out our resources, keep watching for our, uh, as this stuff comes out and uh, we'll continue to send stuff your way to try to give you as many resources as we possibly can. All right. Very good, all right. Doesn't look like any questions I need to answer here. So feel free, uh, go enjoy the rest of your day. It feels like fall out there today. And so take advantage of that and uh, Sign up for those field trips and those author visits and join us for those if you haven't already. Contact your county ag literacy coordinator if you want to get classroom sets of our ag mags. We have brand new pumpkin and apple and there's a ton of other ones there that you can access as well. If you go to our website, aginetheclassroom.org, you can also get uh, online interactive versions of these that have links to different external resources as well. So a number of different ways uh, to get that information. All right, with that, I'm going to sign off here. Thank you so much, everybody. I appreciate you being here, and uh, we'll see you next time.